So welcome to this course. We're going to be having our first debate. This is the first of several debates that we'll have during class. We have uh, three magnificent students who will be representing each other. And there is no particular order in which we're going to be starting. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to give ladies the right to start. You need that light? Yeah? OK. Uh, we'll have ladies to start. So do you want to start? So go ahead. What about NAFTA? We are looking at NAFTA in Mexico. We're looking at all these different transformations. And one of the things that we're discussing in class is whether this type of regional trade agreement, free trade agreement, like the one that we have, Mexico, Canada, and the United States, makes sense for a country as Mexico is, a developing emerging economy. What is your feeling about it? Should we do anything more in NAFTA? Are we doing OK? Well, I think that Na NAFTA can have like more advantage if we convert like to a custom union because it w with the just being up an FTA does doesn't allow us to have more competition like we would have with a custom union. What well, what do you really mean about that? What do you think it is meaning of competition in this context? Uh, to be more like challenging to the other countries and to have a better integration. But you know, she's, she's talking about, you know, one of the problems that we're facing is that it doesn't allow the true competition. What is the meaning then of true competition in the context of a free trade agreement? To be able to have the same level of competition that the other countries, well, the same level of, of welfare and of Acquirance power, I don't know how to say but, it. But, right but, are, but are we talking, you're talking about purchasing power, but I mean, are we talking really about competition or competitiveness? Which are two different things. One thing is, do we have competition inside an economy? Meaning by that, do we have the same set of rules in terms of monopoly and things of that sort that you see in the United States and Canada? Or do we have competitiveness? You know, the whole idea of how do you make an economy more competitive? Free trade tells us that if you open your economy, you will be more competitive. So you think that by doing the free trade agreement with the United States and Canada, is Mexico more competitive today or less competitive than it was, let's say, 10, 15 years back? Well, I think it's more competitive because it's supported by the economies of US and Canada. Well, in my opinion, NAFTA has brought also a lot of bad things to Mexico, like, like the loss of many jobs and the loss of some part of the farmer sectors and well, other stuff. But I think overall Mexico has, has become more competitive. But in terms of competition and in terms of monopoly, I think although we have the same rules, I think <laughs> they're not quite taken here in Mexico. The monopolies are still quite well empowered and I don't see where, when they are going to end. Do you agree with that? Well, I think that Mexico has a big um, or a tremendous competition between the three countries. But I also think that if NAFTA trans get into a coastal union, it's going to be more competitive because other countries can come to the Mexico, US, and Canada to um, invest or something. And Mexico has to be more aware of this because Mm, it will like, it will be like uh, difficult for us if we are not ready to this or we are not on the same level that the other countries are. So, Paula, would you agree with that? Uh, yes, but I, I was going to tell something about what no, he said. Is that so he's wrong in something? What is he wrong in something? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes and no. Uh, that means you will have. Once he finishes, you will have the right to respond, okay? okay? Because whenever someone makes a comment, and this is the rule of a debate, about what the other person is saying, then the other person has the right to respond. So go ahead. Before and after, and after NAFTA, uh, Mexico, instead of losing many jobs, it gains jobs and creates different jobs. And also, the wages are better than before. <laughs> So I don't think that NAFTA had in the part of jobs has like a disadvantage Mexico. Maybe in the in other sectors like agricult agricultural sector has because of the of the subsidies that US gives and here no. But in the 
particular case of the wages and employment, I think that NAFTA has really improved Mexico. No, I think you didn't understand me well. I, I'm not in, well, I'm in favor of NAFTA. Uh -huh. And I'm not saying that Mexico has lost jobs. In fact, yes, I'm with you. I agree with you that Mexico has gained a lot of jobs. But what I was referring to is that NAFTA hasn't benefit Mexico in every sector. There are some sectors that, that received a hard hit because of NAFTA, like I was specifically referring to the small farmer sectors. More than 120 million small farmer jobs were lost in just the first years of, of implementing NAFTA. I'm not saying NAFTA is it's creating a disadvantage for Mexico, but I'm saying that it's not quite, how do I say it? Well, it's not in every sector that Mexico is gaining a benefit, a benefit directly from NAFTA. So tell me, Maria, do you really think that when you go into a free trade agreement, all the sectors in the economy are going to be winning? No, as he was saying. So what Jose is saying, what Paula is saying, is exactly the point of a free trade agreement. Someone is going to win, someone is going to lose. Why do you think that happened in Mexico, in NAFTA? Mm. Well, because of the well, Mexico is like a protectionist country, and was when well, was, but free trade mm -hmm. agreement led the country to put the tariff they want to certain products, right? So I think Mexico should take care of this, maybe to um, improve the agricultural sector or the sectors that has been harmed a lot for this NAFTA. But, but nevertheless, what Jose was saying right, you know, a little while ago was, if you look at the economy and you look at NAFTA, one of the sectors that we had more trouble with was the agricultural sector in Mexico. And then, you know, Paula was saying, because the Americans subsidize agriculture in their economy, particularly, you know, the large corn, grain type mm -hmm. of uh, products. Do you agree with that? And, and what would you think then was missing in the negotiating process between Mexico and the United States. Mm. I mean, first, do you agree with that statement? That uh, because of that subsidy that is provided in the United States, the Mexican agricultural sector will be suffering? Well, it could be because mm, the government, the U.S. government is helping their producers and Mexico is not doing this in this kind of sector. Maybe we are paying attention in another kind of activities or industries in the country that we think that is going to give us uh, better benefits or profits to all of us. So we are maybe losing these sectors because we think that they, it can be so profitable like other ones or something. So you do agree with what we have been looking in class that one of the biggest problems that you will be facing when you are negotiating a free trade agreement is if you are the smaller country you are bound to accept conditions from the larger country that does not necessarily will help you in the long run. Yeah, I think it, I think it works like this because if you are a small country and well we have like advantage and disadvantage to be with US mm -hmm. because US is well the first country in everything in the world but it makes us feel like we have to accept everything they they tell us uh, all the rules and if they say we have to improve in this sector, we say, oh, okay, but we we'll maybe we're You really think that happens? Mm. You mean we are so submissive, the Mexicans, that we say yes to everything mm. the Americans No, no to everything, but it, it's more like, well, I think it's kind of this. You think that that pressure is there and that the Mexican government and the Mexican entrepreneurs <laughs> will be very nice and saying, yes, I accept no. everything. Okay, so there is, there is a negotiating process. The rules of the game, however, is if you're a larger economy and you're a smaller economy, by definition, you'll be winning more if you really join that large economy, and therefore you may be willing, as was stated by some people like Bagwati, you may be willing as a developing nation, as a lower level of development, to accept rules that probably will not be for your benefit in the mm -hmm. long run. That, that's a possibility in this type of negotiation. Mm -hmm. Yeah? That's what you were saying. Was that what you were saying or not? <laughs> okay, so why do you, do you agree with that? How do you agree with that? I mean, wh what should we do then? Should NAFTA then be something that we shouldn't have done? Could you repeat the question? NAFTA, we did it. We shouldn't have done it. 
Should we? Ah, no, no, I think. You still think sense. there are enough benefits? Yeah, I think there are enough benefits. Why? Why do you think so? Well, because a lot of the sectors have improved in, like, like Benny was saying, in job sectors, for example. Name two. What? Name two. The, or one, if you wish. The automotive sector, okay. for instance. What's happening in the automotive sector? Well, what has happened is that Mexico has put preferential tariffs for the United States in order to export cars and auto parts more than other countries. So, yes, United States have a, a competitive advantage, if you could say it that way, in order to purchase Mexican auto parts and Mexican cars than other countries. But Mexico has the, it's like, uh, I don't know how to say it, like, has a secure amount mm -hmm. of cars that are going to be delivered to the United States. So Mexico has not to worry about selling those products to the whole world in order to make a profit and in order to the, okay. the sector to, to work properly. Because of the United, because of the agreement we have with the United States in that sector, more than I was seeing the number, I think it started in 50 percent, and it's worth going to end at 62 or something like that of Mexican auto parts and cars that are sent to the United States. So what you have seen is a big transformation of the automotive industry in Mexico, yep. and it has become a very competitive industry. So competitive, in fact, that because they have the assurance of exporting into the United States and making a large number of cars, mm -hmm. it has allowed our industry not only to complement in terms of the tier levels that you're talking about, you know, you are now having suppliers of auto parts that are also being developed around the final product. But in fact, one of the things that we gain by that is that that industry has become so competitive that not only do we compete in the American market, but as we witness recently, you can export to Brazil, you can export to Argentina, and still become a very competitive industry. Yes. So yes, there is an advantage that we got there, but in the agricultural sector, there are some problems that we should be looking at. Exactly. And I think because of, of the, uh, the trade agreement, Mexico's sector in car making has improved really, really much. And, and around the world, it's seen, well, it's recognized that it, that, that has happened. In fact, I can tell you that Ford Motor Company uses the plan that they have in Hermosillo, Sonora, as the example for the rest of the world, their own plans, telling them that's the level that you should be reaching in oh, terms of yeah, benchmarking. Yeah. This, the Hermosillo, Sonora plant in, from Ford Motor Company is the benchmarking plant for the Ford Motor you know, industry, or well, the Ford Motor Company as a whole in the world. So let's go to a different point. I mean, this is nice. This was NAFTA. We have some problems. But should we continue then with the process and become a customs union or something more? No, I don't think so. You don't think so? No. Okay, so tell us why. This is news to me, but that's okay. <laughs> because we, we will have to say, well, now, right now we have the free trade between the three countries, but we will establish a, a, an equal tariff for the third countries. And so well, you, you like the idea of a common external tariff? You don't like that? No, no, not too much. Because the national producers are going to suffer more than this with NAFTA because it's going to be more competi competition from the other countries. Why, why would you think that? You would think that because our level of protection in Mexico, given that we have a free trade agreement, you can have different levels of protection vis-a-vis -vis the third world countries, okay? Other countries outside the area. And, and you will expect that if we join the United States into a customs union and Canada, we will have to lower our tariffs even more? Is that your concern? And that you will be facing as country more competition mm -hmm. from outside. Is that what you are concerned about? Yeah, because everyone is going, is going to be, well, is going to have the, the, the option to, to look if they want to invest in Canada, US or Mexico. And maybe we are going to lose this kind of investments if the other countries are more free or more. Paul, do you agree with that? Um, I have a different point of view. Go ahead. I think that 
Yeah, if Be we, aggressive. If we have... <laughs> If we make NAFTA into a custom union, yes, there are going to be many disadvantages, like the fact that maybe we are going to lose sovereignty, but also we will have many advantages, for example, that if we convert all, all our trade, our ta uh, external tariff as the same as US and Canada, we will not have so much trade diversion like we have now with with an FTA, and we will have more trade creation because having the same um, external tariff will make that the countries, uh, well, and, uh, and uh, the same, uh, an FTA and uh, QCM union. union in the terms of trade creation are, are almost the same. Okay. Are very similar. But, when but, but at this point, we already have a free trade agreement, uh -huh. okay? So we are not starting from a point where we are just beginning to decide whether we go into a customs union or a free trade agreement. We do have a free trade agreement. We want to transform that into a customs union. If we do that, one of the things that we will have to respect is the lowest tariff will be the common external tariff. Because one of the rules of the WTO is you do not create these kind of things precisely to divert trade. What you do is, you will not affect third countries. So one of the things that you face is, if I'm going to be putting a common external tariff, that external tariff will have to be in the region. So we may end up with some tariffs where we will be lowering even more our tariff system. So we can have that because the United States may be lower tariff or Canada may be the lowest tariff, okay? But they also will be facing the same thing. In some problems, they may be protecting certain industries. And all of a sudden, we have the lowest tariff in Mexico. They will have to abide by that tariff. This is, this is a two-way, or if you want in this case, three-way game, okay? It's not only Mexico. The United States and Canada will also have to understand that whatever the lowest tariff in the region is going to be the common external tariff, yeah? So there are wins and, and losses in that sense, but at the same time what you're saying is, but that will allow us to have more trade creation. Yes. How do you see that happening? More than what we already have, which is a huge amount. Mm -hmm. Are we going to be stealing trade from outside, or are we going to be getting more trade from outside? When I talk about outside, I'm talking the region, okay? Mm -hmm. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. <laughs> You're saying that we are going to be having more trade. Uh -huh. Are we going to be having more trade inside from the countries that are inside? Or are we going to be having more trade because countries from outside now are going to be able to get into not only the United States and Canada, but also Mexico with the lowest tariff Sorry. of the group? Uh -huh. uh, uh, from the countries of outside. That's what you would expect. Yep. But then we're going to be losing as Mexicans, because probably someone will then be selling things that we used to sell to Canada and the United States. And remember, this is called erosion. We are having an erosion process as we allow tariffs to go down. The benefits that we gain entering into a free trade agreement, we are losing now because we are reducing the tariffs of the group. But, for example, uh between Mexico and Canada and US, we have like non-tariff. Mm -hmm. So there we have like a certain uh, advantage from other countries. And also, if we allow, uh, if we have the same tariff, uh, instead of uh, one country first go to Mexico, for example, because it has a lower tariff and then export to US, that will not be more a problem because that uh, the union custom allows that, that there are no problems in that case. Okay, but you will expect that you will have more people getting products from outside into a region than it was the case before. Yes. Okay, you will expect that. Mm -hmm. You too? Well, yes, I think the... Why? You cannot say yes, why? <laughs> Think about what we're talking about. All of a sudden, we have three countries, okay? We have a free trade agreement, therefore, inside the area, there are no tariffs. We went down to zero, <coughs> not necessarily in everything, but in most of the products. 
Let's suppose that we reach the level of zero tariff between the three countries, okay? So among the three countries, we no longer have tariffs and we have free trade. But we decided to keep protection from outsiders into our region, okay? Uh, as you do that, there is something called rules of origin. What is the meaning of that? Rules of origin. Yeah. As you do this thing, as you, as, you, as you unify your market and you say, well, we are now a single market in that sense, in the sense of a free trade agreement. But at the same time, I have different tariffs as Mexico from the tariff system that you have as the United States and the tariff system that Canada has. Given that, there is a problem called rules of origin, which means what? Well, I'm not really sure, but I think the, it should refer to keeping the, the trade between the three countries that were originally in the agreement mm -hmm. so that they do not lose either competitiveness or the share of, of their markets in the... Yeah. But one of the things that you'll be saying is, wait a minute, I don't want to be just a country that will import something from outside. Let's suppose that Mexico says, well, I can bring products from China at zero tariff into my economy. Once they got into my economy at zero tariff, even though the economy called the United States had a 20% tariff, because I don't have any tariff between you and me as part of the free trade agreement, then I bring it from China and I pass it into, into the United States. If you do that, you are violating the principle of the free trade agreement because what you are doing yes. is you are importing to pass it there. So you create a rule which is called rule of origin. A certain percentage of the content that the product has needs to be done inside, inside. the free trade. So given that rule of origin, one of the problems that you're facing is obviously, as I have different levels of tariffs, I will have then that problem. But let's suppose that I bring all the tariffs into a common external tariff. Then what happens? Should I continue to have the rules of origin? What, what would be your feeling? Should we continue the rules of origin? Or should we allow anyone to bring anything from outside and sell it inside? I think we should continue the rules of origin because yeah. if we do not continue the, well, the trade diversion that we have be, uh, inside the, the free trade agreement yeah. will maybe lost in some point. Okay. I'm not quite sure, but I think that in the future, well, in terms okay. of long term. So I imagine maybe. you are a company and you made an investment in Mexico because you want to take advantage of the fact that you have this huge market now. And so you're going to be working in one of these companies, hopefully, yeah? or it will be your company, whichever. Hopefully. And you make the investment in this country, and you say, because I'm going to be having this market. And all of a sudden, anyone can get into that market without any protection. You say, well, wait a minute. I mean, we have to protect our market. And then the rule of origin will allow me to protect my market. Using that word, protect, means that this is a protectionist measure, isn't it? Mm. Rule of origin? Isn't that a protectionist measure? Yeah, because they... Isn't that what Anne Kruger says? What? In her article? Anne Kruger in her article. The yeah, one that you're supposed to have read. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But it says that, we, well, Mexico have to so look for a certain part of the production to keep in the country <coughs> and not allow the other country, like you were saying, that comes for for example, for China or something. Like, they would use our country as a a step or something to get into the another market, yeah. a trampoline, yeah, so. Jump into the swimming pool, <laughs> get through my trampoline. Those are the questions that you will be asking. Now, let's go back to what Jose was saying a little while ago, labor. Shouldn't then we go into some kind of a common market with the United States and Canada and bring NAFTA one step further so that we can discuss labor, mobility. Well, I, I frankly don't, don't see that happening soon because... Yeah, well, that's fine, but I mean, don't you think we should push it for it? Oh, yeah, I think we should, but because of the United States, like... They're nice people. Yeah, I know they're <laughs> nice people, but they're really afraid of, of their sovereignty and losing their jobs and letting people enter their country and well I, I don't know that's my point of view I think that they they are the ones that are not pushing well 
Canada also is, has its step back, but they're the ones that they're not pushing like. Oh, Canada, you know, Canada looks at Mexico so far away yeah. that they don't worry about this. Americans look at us and say, well, this is the common border, yeah? Between you and I, guys. So if people are going to stay in any place, they're going to stay in my country. They're not going to go all the way to Canada. They're too far. It's too cold. You know, we like warm weather. We Mexicans enjoy warm weather. <laughs> Except if you don't like going skiing. But most of us enjoy the beaches. Yeah? Exactly. So the question for you as Mexica, would it make sense to move one step further and try to reach an agreement that will go from a free trade union into a common market? where you will have free mobility of goods, people, and services? Well, it would make sense for, for some sectors, like the job gaining sector and the, immigri the immigrant issues that has well, been struggling with the US for so many years. But I think we should first consider, like, let me straighten my ideas, leaving our, well, I don't know how to, how to say it. Say it in Spanish, quickly. De tener, o sea, de realmente dejar bien estipulado nuestra parte de participación en su mercado. So you think that we should be put in quotas. This is the way that people should move from country A to country B and to work in a certain percentage or something like that, yeah? That, Maybe. that, that will help. Okay, but that will be a negotiating process. In the end, you really want to have a free mobility of people. Because, mm -hmm. you see, this is, this is interesting. We always, as Mexicans, talk about our people going to the United States. But we never consider that the Americans are going to come to Mexico mm -hmm. also. Because there is going to be a lot of high-paid jobs in Mexico that will be of interest to people in the United States. And so, in the end, it's not only a question of Mexicans going into the United States, it's also Americans coming to Mexico that will be taken into consideration. Let's open the floor to the public and see whether they have any questions or ideas. Oh, there we have one. Volunteer? Yes. Um, when you say about that, uh, who, who, who is we? I don't know who is we. Uh, you have three debaters here, so go for them. Mm? Yeah. <laughs> Which one of the three you want to ask? I don't know. Well, I don't know Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, when we talk about the common market within NAFTA, like the free movement of people and stuff, like, does it um, include like a minimum wage, like in like the three different countries or not? And like, if if it's the same, like, do you think it would like affect us like as Mexican or like? Different, how we So, there you have a question. Go for it. I think that the wages uh, will continue the same because each country has like its minimum and wages. So I think, for example, that maybe not the problem, but if we have like free trade movement with persons, the the Mexicans that will go to the U.S., they will be, uh, most of them, labor force because of the type of education that we have in Mexico. So, and the, the people of the U.S. coming here or staying there will have uh, better paid jobs because they are more, um, they have better education. So maybe the work will be like divide for not all, but for Mexicans, that is work that maybe doesn't require uh, too much infor too much education, formation, etc., than for the people of the U.S. What about you? You think that? Well, I think you that mean, it, you mean you will never be able to get a job in the United States because you're Mexican, yeah? <laughs> well, I think it can be the same. I mean, do you agree well, with her that, that you're not going to get a job because you're Mexican? No. Okay. <laughs> so in the end, what do you expect that will give you, you as a person? Uh, that U.S. give me... No, this, yeah. this agreement uh -huh. where you have labor mobility and you are part of the labor mobility. Do you think that you will not be able to get a job in, let's say, uh, Citibank or, or you think that that will help you get a better job? Well, it can help, but I think that if, there, if, if the free trade agreement led the movement of people, it's 
also going to be like a um, security problem, maybe, for oh. because we have trolls about many things. Yeah. But for me, I, <laughs> I think it will be good because I... Look at the question that she asked, okay? She asked whether a minimum wage will be different. And the answer that I'm trying to look around with you is, first, yes, the probability that low paid jobs will be the ones that Mexico will get at the beginning is true. But at the same time, if you have an open market for labor, what will happen is all of us, therefore, will be part of that market, okay? And so we will be com there will be more competition in general for everybody, mm -hmm. okay? Because it will be easier now for any one of us to apply to positions in the United States, and it will be easier for Americans to apply for positions in Mexico. And therefore, it's just a question of whether you want to move to one place or the other. So the minimum wage issue becomes a new issue. It's, it's, not, it's not important in the end. Because what will happen is you will be expecting people to go where the jobs are, do those jobs, and then slowly, slowly, could take 10 years, 20 years, I don't know, but slowly, what you will see is an equalization of wages all over the region. Now, if you look at the United States as a country, wages in the United States are not equal, okay? It's not like a person living in New York and doing a certain job doesn't necessarily get the same wage that the person in Oklahoma. Because cost of living is different, situation is different, demand is different. And so you will be looking at the same pattern that you see today in Mexico, the United States, and Canada, but in a different perspective, which is the person working in Mexico City may get a better salary for that job than a person working in Puebla. Yeah? Larger amount of payment. But they also have a larger amount of expenditure. And therefore, it just makes sense. So in the end, the answer to your question is, it's a mute issue. Because what will happen, if you really have full mobility, people will go where the jobs are, and the jobs then will start being equal in terms of payment. Now, this may take time, yes. And there will be differences, yes. If you look at the United States, wages are not the same all over the country. If you look at Mexico, Wages for the same profession are not the same all over the country. If you look at Canada, the same thing happens. So there's going to be no big deal. The only thing is there's going to be more competition. Because then I can apply for a job in the United States, but an American can apply for a job in Mexico. OK? We have time for one final question. Well, I, I, I wanted to know, like, well, NAFTA, um, I think it's our, well, the second best of Mexico. And because we, as we were talking about, like, we, will be better with a free uh, labor zone agreement or well, movement with people. But you were saying like custom unions, if, if we have custom unions, will be better. Well, I want to ask you, what would be the point of being of custom un union? Like what, what would be the, our vision? Like to be more integrated? And if, if that's uh, my question, then we would have also the free labor zone and like European Union, like what it's our vision and going custom unions and then step uh, forward in that. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> well, like, uh, well, the central question is like, if you are supporting custom unions, my question is why it's uh, the vision of Mexico? Like, what what do we want? Like, it's uh, we want only the same tariffs and with well, other countries and that's it? Or we want to be more integrated with the United States and Canada and um, in 30 years, 50 years, like European Union is doing right now, like going uh, more steps. It's both, because the Christian Union is like the next step to have a common market and that will allow, like uh, our professor said, to have like free movement between work and etc. but also having the same tariff Will, will make us to have more competition, but also be more competi competitive. So we will have to, to put out all our forces to make better products with cheaper prices, better technology. So I think that uh, consumers will be better with uh, a custom union. Okay. Well, I think can I say something? I, th I think also it's important to say that if we're going to be competing with the U.S. people and Canadian people for, for the jobs, for the better jobs, the Mexi Mexico in general has to improve, will we'll have to improve a lot his education, education system. system. 
his education richness, I think. For, because if we do not do that, the better jobs that we will open in Mexico are going to be taken by, by US people or Canadian people. So the custom union at the end will also improve the, the final like, way of living in Mexico, I think. Because for better competing in Mexicans, you're going to need more education and you're, the government's going to need to provide it because if not, Mexico, it's going to be left away, be yeah, left behind, I think. Okay, we have three minutes. I'm going to give you each one of you one minute closing statement about whether it makes sense to go one step further in the integration with the United States and Canada. I, um I disagree with the next, next step, Custom Union, because as he was saying, we have different levels of everything, and we have, as Mexico, to improve education and pol policies like fiscal, and we also have a lot of corruption. I think that it will be a problem with the U.S. and with the Canada. Maybe they are also, they also have corruption, but we, we are like in a big, level, I think. So we have really to improve <coughs> many kind of things here in the country to get into another step. So you think that we should wait, wait. solve some of the internal problems and then move one step further? Yeah. Okay. I think that uh, converting NAFTA into a, a custom union is really a good idea. But also, we have to improve many things that my, my friend has said, like education. <laughs> but if we don't do the first step, like custom union, we will not do the next step, like common market, that will benefit us. Of course, there, there, there are many improvements that are needed, but doing the first step make, uh, will make the government to take like roles and say, oh, we are losing competition, not competitiveness, so we have to improve education, we have to improve technology, infrastructure, to be as equal as US and Canada, and so that union can make sense. Okay. Well, I think it's the other way around. I think that if we do go forward with the custom union, Mexico is gonna have to improve on every, in all those sectors because it's not going to be by itself anymore. And it's the level of corruption, I think it's going to be going down because now Mexico has to, to like share his information and to provide the other two countries with, with like the statements, I don't know, the, the final statements of what's going on with our country. And it's, it's just like, like the thing with Pemex, I think that Pemex has not, well, in my point of view, has not accepted private investment because, well, they can do whatever they want with the money. So if we do enter in a custom union, I think corruption level will go down and therefore we will be able to expand much more our sectors and our liabilities and our education and everything. And I think we do not have to first deal with these issues. I think the custom union will help us deal with these issues because we're not going to be by ourselves anymore. And we will, well, yeah, that's it. No, I want to thank the three of you. This was a great debate. This is the first debate of many on this topic, okay? So be ready. We'll be back to you with NAFTA, more NAFTA. What should we do with NAFTA? Thank you very much. Okay, welcome once again. We are now debating a different issue. We are now very concerned about whether Mexico should be looking south rather than north and whether Mexico should be joining Mercosur. Is that an idea that we have been talking in Mexico in many, many ways, but people really don't understand what it means. So we have two big experts right now with us. Jocelyn, thank you very much for being here with us. Andres, thank you very much. And we're going to be talking about the possibilities of joining. I'm going to do the honor to Andres, this time is not ladies first, for him to start. Andres, what do you think we should be doing? Should we go into Mercosur? Should we really apply for membership for Mexico? Because that makes sense in terms of an integration process with uh, you know, nations that are more similar to us than other countries. 
Well, I don't know that. I don't think that Mexico have to join to Mercosur. If we, Mexico wants to join, I, I think it's just for a relationship. Mm -hmm. with the Latin a American political state. relationship. Just yes. for a political re uh, relationship. And you don't see any economic advantage of going with Brazil? Huge market. Well, we have right now like a bilateral trade. And also we, we have a, a lot of exports and imports from, from Brazil. But just Brazil and Uruguay, I don't see why Mexico have to join the Mercosur. You don't see that as a possibility of interest from the economic standpoint. From a political standpoint, you find that attractive? Yeah. yeah. Why? Why would you attract yeah. politically speaking? Politically speaking, isn't, isn't it nice to be close to the Americans rather than the Brazilians? Well, I mean, Copacabana is nice, but I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice, it's nice, but I don't, think, I don't think so. Mexico doesn't have a, a closer relationship with, with Latin America, just so few countries. Uh, in political, in political meaning, I, in relationship political meaning, I think is is good for Mexico because it's like the people see like Mexico is open to to his his friends, his I don't know, and their economic senses. I think that Mexico have to to enjoy to join with the Mercosur. Do you agree with that, Joseph? Yeah. Should be, we should be looking politically, but not economically. Or is there some economic advantages for going into Mercosur? I um, agree, but not completely. Because I think that Mexico cannot look for the Mercosur in any point. Nor political or neither um, the economic point. Why? Because, yeah, our polit politicians, I don't <laughs> say what politicians or who politicians, but I think that those politicians are just saying like we are going to sign the the Mercosur agreement, but it's not like the real face of that because they are just saying to maintain the relationship with the other countries that are our like our brothers, and it's like the feeling to be Latin, but it's not like the real face because if we go to the Mercosur, we are going to lose a lot. A lot of things that we have, especially with competition, because those countries in Latin America are so similar to us. So, one thing is that if are, are they similar because they are also, you know, the same race as we are, mm -hmm. or because they speak Spanish, or are we similar in terms of the economic structure? No, I think that we are so similar in the economic structure, especially be because we have so similar, for, for example, sources. Mm -hmm. So, and that kind of arrangements or in that kind of agreements, we don't have like so much competitiveness. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, if we go to the Mercosur and we try to sell to, I don't know, to Brazil some sources, and they said, okay, but I have it, so I don't need it. So we are not going to have like so much uh, advantage of it. And I think that is one thing that is important to take in account of that kind of agreements because Mercosur, I think it's not going to be good for us. But tell me, Andres, Mercosur, what kind of an agreement is? Because what we're talking about is whether Mexico should integrate into Mercosur. What, what kind of an agreement is Mercosur? Well, Mercosur is a regional agreement. And all in it's a free trade agreement. It's a, when you talk about a regional agreement, what is the meaning of that? Uh, how does it operate? It's a it's like a custom union because okay. you, if you are in, in Argentina, you can move in Brazil the free. You can you can move labor force. But what do you mean by a custom union? Meaning what? Uh, how is it different from a free trade agreement? Uh, the tariff. Well, it's custom union, but also it's not a custom union. It's a free trade because they are they have uh, tariffs is between zero to twenty percent. It depends in the in the commodities. But is that a common tariff? Yeah, they have zero, zero between the countries. Yeah, but we also have zero between Mexico so and the United States. Yeah, but they are a big block. It is a big block. So they have more countries. There are five countries, four countries, and now they are expecting to have two more. So I think it's an but advantage for the Mercosur. Doesn't that make it more attractive than these other two countries? We only have two countries, Canada and the United States. And we can have now five countries, Venezuela, Brazil, Uruguay, 
Paraguay, Argentina, and maybe Bolivia. Isn't that better? Six countries rather than yeah. two? I think that it sounds attractive, but it's not, because the Mexican... Um, you think those countries are more interesting as economic countries than United States and Canada? No, of course not. Why? In the case of Mexico, I think that... No, think about the United States and Canada. And Canada, okay. And think about Brazil and Argentina. No, I think that... That's What's the size of the market? I think that, okay, Brazil and Argentina, in conjunction, it will have a big market, but it not will be so attractive for, for other countries. What will be the biggest problem if we want to join Mercosur? They are a customs union, and therefore, what will be the kind of agreement we will have to sign? To take their tariffs, and the problem is that if we have NAFTA, we don't have uh, like tariff with the U.S. and Canada, but if we agree with uh, the Mercosur, uh, we will have to sign that we will take the new tariff to the other countries that are around the world. In the other countries that are around the world, and are the big countries are U.S. and Canada. So it will it will be the problem because we will have like contrapuntos. Yeah with those countries because we are going to be in the middle of those blocks. Transition. I think that Mercosur needs more Mexico than Mexico needs more Mercosur. Because yeah, that, that may be true, but think about this. Mercosur is one kind of agreement. Yeah. So if Mexico wants to join Mercosur, what would be the requirements for Mexico? To lower well, the requirements is like the we, same we, tariff, we, the same tariff. So Mexico will have to accept. No, a yeah. Common external tariff. But Mexico have uh, has other other treatment is is the Ali Association Latinoamericana de Integración, who is a a better tariff than the Mercosur. But that's a different type of thing. What we're talking about right now is Mexico may be interested in joining Mercosur. Okay. If Mexico wants to join join Mercosur as a full member as Brazil is, and Argentina so is, yes. Uruguay, Paraguay. Strange the way that Venezuela got there, but that's fine. How will you see the negotiating process? Mexico will have to say, I do agree to what? I do agree with the common tariff that okay. the, all the and members so have. We will have to take the common external tariff yeah. that exists today in Mercosur as our, as our system, system of tariffs. Is that possible for Mexico at this point? Well, it is possible, it is possible, but it's negative to Mexico because, as I say, we have all, we have other trade agreement. It's called ALADI, Association of American Integration, who we have a lower tariff in in, in stern to. But Brazil also has ALADI. They're also yeah. part of ALADI. But I think that one important point of that is that if we have, if, if Mexico has a lower tariff than the Mercosur has right now, Mercosur is going to say, no way, we are not going to lower our tariff because okay. it's not like the best way for us. So the problem to Mexico is we have to increase our tariff and US and Canada are going to say, no way, you can't increase your tariff because you are commercializing with us, so it's imp impossible to do that. So I think that is going to be the, the big problem to be in Mercosur and also with NAFTA. So so there is a clear aspect of difficulty right now, which is if I'm going to be joining as a full member Mercosur, I have to consider and ponder what am I losing in terms of my relationship with the United States and Canada. Because, and we have a lot of others, okay, but in particular these two. Because the obligation if I join them is I'm going to be respecting the common external tariff because they are a customs union. And so I need to walk into that economy and say, I will be doing this, yeah? Yes. And so you see that as an impossibility? Yes. No, it is possible, but well, you see it as well. It is possible, but so I see as that. Because the whole market that we have is U.S. The 80% of our person exports come from U.S. So if we, if we assume that we are going to be in the Mercosur, we are going to have a lot of losses. Okay. And so, was this a mistake then of us? Rather than going to Mercosur first and then going to NAFTA, we went to NAFTA first and that is putting these chains on us that we cannot break so that we can be with our brothers from Latin America. Is that a mistake? We made a mistake in going to NAFTA rather than having gone to Mercosur first? Uh, of course not. 
Why? Why? Well, because the United States and Canada are better economies and a more solid economy than the Latin America. And also, Argentina and Brazil is not a. a Socios confiables? Mm -hmm. Trust. Worthy. Trust. 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 You know, like, as we see with Argentina, with. What do you mean they are not trustworthy partners? I mean, are you talking anything about these Brazilians? I mean, they're nice people. I, I, I'm not angry. I just say that, that it's, it's more secure being. Look, look at the people, you know, they're, they're upset about this. <laughs> yeah, but I think that. They, they like the soccer team of Brazil. You know? <laughs> yeah, but I think that one point of this is that those countries in Latin America are so protect, protectionist. Okay. So, one point is, for example, we have a real case with the Volkswagen, that when we want to export our cars, they say, wait, we have the same market, and you are not going to enter to our market, so we are going to protect that. So I'm sorry, but you are not going to be in our market. So I think that... But isn't that what we should be saying also as Mexicans? I mean, sorry, yeah. this is my market, let me protect it. Yeah, so I think that it will be like a problem for us to be in Mercosur, because if we want to try with them, and they have like the same product, they will, they, are going to say, okay, if we have the same, so we are going to protect, you are going to protect. So the trade is not going to be like, so beneficial for, for the countries. So one of the problems that you are saying, and Andres is going to answer this one, one of the problems that you are seeing right now is, as you put together a market such as the market of Brazil and the market of Mexico, because we have such a similarity in our production structures, it will be very complicated to make a negotiating process. Is that your feeling also? That we have that problem in itself? Well, I, I think the AI is a problem. I, I was I was hearing a, a conversation in YouTube. We were saying that Lula Silva was say to to the to our Lula, 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 Lula the ex president of Brazil. Ex -president okay. Was it to Calderon? Was it to join to the Mercosur? But I think he was just hypocrisy, hypocrisy because oh my because God. yeah because. <laughs> Because Brazil, <laughs> Brazil, Brazil doesn't, doesn't, doesn't. Uh, you don't think that he really meant it? I don't think that he really. You think meant it was just posturing? Yeah, I, I, I think that because we are, we have the, the Lula da Silva just posturing. That's it. No, no. I, and, I so, and so when we answer, when we answer, and we say yes, it's very important for us to have a free trade agreement with Brazil. We are also posturing the Mexicans. No, because we have. We are honest people. We really mean what we say. <laughs> the, we have the seven, the seven, seventy-five percent of of the. Of the okay. So the point the you are making is, when our president Calderon at the time went to Brazil and talked to whoever Lula da Silva or Madame Rousseff, you know, uh, what you were saying is, if Calderon was saying, we are going to be trying to make a free trade agreement with Brazil, he was also posturing. Because it's no. impossible. No, we no? have, we have a, a. We can do it. We can do it. Uh, but the Brazilians don't. Oh yes. The Brazil, uh, yeah, the Brazil, of course, Brazil. Brazil so, 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 so Lula da Silva was also honest. He was thinking, maybe we can do this. Well, I think he was thinking in in our way to to see other markets to see. Okay, I'm Mexico now, right now. I can be closer to the United States. I can be closer to Canada. Okay, Mexico joined to Mercosur, we are friends. Okay. Uh, but let me make a point to the two of you because I think it's important that we discuss this. What we're talking about is politicians enjoy saying things and they probably mean them, okay? They probably are honest people and they want to do that. But reality is different. Yeah. And reality is something that we as business people have to look at. If I'm really going to be trying to do anything in terms of Mercosur, there is a complication for our country as we go into that combination, we will need to accept the rules of Mercosur because they already have a customs union, or they will have to accept my rules, which means for them to accept me, they will have to lower their tariff, their common external tariff, to the levels that I have with the United States and Canada. So it is possible. I can do these things, theoretically. theoretically yes. But from the standpoint of reality, it's going to be very complicated. It's going to be very complicated because Volkswagen already made investments in Brazil and in Mexico, and it will be facing a situation where if I really go and make that, then it could make more sense for Volkswagen just to keep their factory in Mexico because it's the most efficient, and therefore they will be losing in terms of that investment. So even from the standpoint of business people, it's not easy, is it? No, it's not, because okay. you have to take into account a lot of points. Okay, so one of the things that we're talking right now is we can talk a lot and we can say a lot, but then we have to look at reality. 
And reality is, what is the kind of market I have? What kind of agreements I have? And what is the market they have? Now, one of the points that we were making in class is this difficulty, because we have moved into these free trade agreements, regional agreements, to understand all the derivations of the combination when I want to join a different trade agreement. Yeah? This is what uh, Bhagwati calls the spaghetti ball effect, spaghetti yeah? ball, yeah. where I get very confused about the rules because I have rules with one country, rules with other country, and then I can talk things, but when I get into the detail of doing those things, it's not that it's bad faith, okay? It's not a question of uh, hypocrisy. Yeah. It's more a question of, <laughs> I really would like to do that, but then I go into reality and reality hits me. And reality hits me because I started doing a process where it's not multilateral negotiations, but rather bilateral, plurilateral, that has prevailed in the past 20, 30 years, 50 years. And that has made life complicated for all of us, okay? So uh, yeah, you may, you may find that as, as, sometimes it sounds uh, as hypocrisy, but, but it's not really that. It's, it's, you have this willingness to do it because I enjoy doing things with Brazil. I would like to be yeah, but, we, economy, but, but it's very difficult to do it. But yeah. When you see numbers, you see like, what are you talking about, you know? Yeah, when Brazil say, yeah, I come to Mercosur, but most of the people doesn't know what, what is really going on in the Mercosur, and what's really going on in the, in the, in the economy of, of Brazil and the economy of Mexico. And I just, I just, was, I just hear it and I just say, what, what are you talking about, you know? It's and and yet there are a lot of business people who really would like to do it. Oh, of course. Why? Of course. Because they see all marker, all markers, all all. Also, Mexico, Mexico has a hundred million of people, and it's a lot of markets, a lot of money there. And when when businessmen say, "Oh, I, mean, I have a, a, I got a, a preferred trade agreement or trade agreement," I don't know. Uh, with Mexico, Mexico has a hundred million of people, a, a lot of poverty. It's money there. But we also have a lot of money. Yeah? We are middle income, $9,000, $10,000 per capita. Huge market. What about then, if we cannot do that, mm. what is life for Mexicans then? It's always north, nothing south? Well, I think that they can look for south, but in just like multilateral or bilateral agreements, just like, okay, I'm going to do an agreement with Argentina, and that's, and that's it. Because if we talk with the whole Houston Union, it could be like difficult. How is it possible to do that? What is the meaning then of Aladi, since you brought it out? Later I will tell you what the English acronym is. But uh, <laughs> what, what do you do with Aladi? Do you think our audience knows anything about Aladi? Do you want to ask anyone in the audience whether they know anything about Aladi? I don't know if they know about Aladi. So should we instruct them? Let's, let's tell them what Aladi is. Well, Aladi is confirmed by 14 countries. And is a, I really, really don't know what Aladi is. It's a trade agreement. It's a trade, it's a, it's it's a trade agreement, a, yeah, it's a trade agreement with, with 40, 40 countries. Uh, all, all of these countries are Latin Americans, yeah? Yes, all of okay. these countries are Latin Americans. So? And the meaning of Aladi. Association of American Integration. Okay. So it's a process of integration that was developed a long time ago. And what it allows today is the possibility of doing, even within this combination where I have a free trade agreement with the United States and Canada, and I have a free trade agreement with the Central American countries, and Brazil, Argentina, etc., have Mercosur as a common customs union, still I can do one on one negotiations through the Aladi scheme. Yeah? Okay. And so I can utilize Aladi to do the negotiating process with Brazil, with Argentina, the way that you were talking, Jocelyn, okay? Yes. That's the same with the Andinas mm -hmm. treatment. And the Andinas. Yes, yes. Andinas and the UNASUR. Yeah. UNASUR that is making the same. That you can do agreements with other countries and you don't have so much problems with us, with a calcium union. But doesn't this Sounds funny. I mean, here I am discussing whether we should move Mercosur, and then all of a sudden we say, well, yeah, but we cannot because of this. However, we can use Aladi to do one-on-one -on -one negotiations. So we can reach a free trade agreement with Brazil. Yeah? That's what we do. That's what Mexico do in the past years. 
Mexico, like, okay, uh, watch the Mercosur, is six countries. What countries I, I needed? Brazil, okay, I have Brazil. I have the 70% of the Mercosur with Brazil. Okay, I have Uruguay. Okay, I have Uruguay, I have Argentina, but Argentina is no well right now, but I have, I have a country with Argentina. Well, Venezuela, you don't know what happened in Venezuela right now. Well, tomorrow maybe we'll say what you want to, I don't know, to throw the money or to exp explode some, some, oh, some you know, company. We, we, we basically we don't know anything. We don't, have we, a, we don't know a, what the hell situation of Mr. Chavez is right now, but you know, take it that way. One of the problems that we're talking about right now is exactly again and again and again the same problem is. As you go into this negotiating process, what you're finding is there are so many different types of agreements that it becomes very complicated for a company, a business company, to understand what is really happening. But what we see also is that it is possible to remain as part of NAFTA and at the same time have an agreement with Brazil, even though Brazil remains part of Mercosur. So this custom union thing is not necessarily something I will have to accept. Yeah? Yes. And, and I can then negotiate one exactly. on one through a different structure. Yes. Okay. Any final work? Mm, no, I think that probably we can look, uh, still looking for US and Canada that are our market. Our what about China? You don't like China? China. Yeah. Isn't that a huge market? Yeah, yeah but I think that the, there are some issues that we have to take into account. To, talking about China because China is a real big competitor. So I think that in that in that point, the competitive competitiveness about Mexico and China could be a factor that could affect the treatments between those countries. But we can look for China too as a possibility. Yeah, as a, possibility. a huge possibility. We have to. Yeah, really big huge. You think that we should? We should. Because so you like going I, that I, way? I like going all markets. I, I think we are so dependent to the United States. And uh, as I say... We should go Pacific. What? We should go Pacific. Uh, we, should, we should go, I don't know... Anywhere. If, <laughs> anywhere. Just okay. diversify. No looking just United States and Canada. Just diversify because in the United States, like, like 2008, is a lot of example. The Mexico is, okay. is really, really don't prepare for So you don't like the idea of going one step further into NAFTA integration? One step further, going more and more integration with the United States and Canada? Well, I like because we need it. We have a, a yeah. million of Mexican there. But no more. This is it. No. What we have? No. I Let, think let's go with China differently. We don't have to wait for I think if we, if we are wasting a lot of time in, in the United States, well, we have to look at other market, but I think the best right now, right now in, in Mexico is looking for a custom union to, to the United States. If, if this happens, it's going to be great for Mexico. And then you, 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 are, you are a more competitive market. You have a more competitive people because we, are a, we have a custom union. Also, right now, Mexico is the most competitive uh, business in, in Latin America because we have like a, a partnership in the United States and in the United States is, how do you say, is, no speed in which us. The request, they ask. It's, it's, it, it, they ask a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of <coughs> things like, like uh, security things, like. Uh, but we are losing sovereignty, but that's a different story. You're okay. going to be invited in the next debate on after. Now we're going to open this for the audience. Any questions from the audience? Opinions? Well, I, I wanted to ask you something. If you are in favor of, um, na we have NAFTA now, yeah. and you are in favor of going into a custom union with, with NAFTA, but you are not in favor of going to Mercosur, which is also a custom union. So, okay, well, that's the first point. So if you agree on that, shouldn't we uh, be looking more uh, for a, a whole integration, like the whole American integration, like not only uh, USA and Canada that are our neighbors that benefits us more than Latin America, but shouldn't we uh, have the vision of a whole American Union, like European Union, but now with, with Canada and also Brazil and Argentina and just being one? I mean... I think being one is going, is going to be the same like like the European Union, 
and it's not going to happen. Maybe in 10 years, I'm sure it's going, not going to happen that be the just one. And if you are, if it is, it's going to be good for Mexico, I don't know. Can I answer your question? Probably, I, I, I'm not sure. But I suppose that the goal is that to just construct one, one block. But the point is that if we do that, we have to do a lot of, of arrangements, like fiscal policies, uh, like political policies, and something like that. And one important, and is like the most, the most risky point about that is that we in Latin America, we have a lot of weak countries that are not like so stable. So the stability of those countries can get like a problem if we get just one block. So it's supposed to is a goal to get one block. Right now we are looking just for one north block and one south block. And then probably we, we can get the Caribbean block. And it's supposed then we can get the Caribbean block with the north block in, one, in, one, in just one block. And it's a goal to have one block in north and south, just one. But it's really difficult. It's hard to do that because it's not just to say, okay, we're going to do that. We're just going to be one. It's like it, it takes long, so much time to, to do analysis about economies and everything like that. If you look when the NAFTA started and when the Mercosur started and when the, the Commun Union that is now started, they take a lot, a lot of time to, to know how or which countries are going to be in, in, that, in that role because it's not too easy. So it's supposed that we have that vision, but it's not too simple. We have someone in the audience who doesn't agree with you. Mm -hmm. So actually, I think that compared to the other group, you're more pro-business people. But being, comparing reality to theory, it's difficult, right, to, to apply that because of the political schemes. For instance, about labor, how are we planning to have one market with NAFTA if we can't even uh, get rid of this there, right? So what would you suggest in the political aspects to apply all this great theory? Good. So let's start with you, Andre. That will be the last statement. What do you suggest, politically speaking, that we should be doing so that we can overcome this difficulty that we are talking about. Because we all agree it makes sense to have a free trade of the Americas agreement. Yeah? Okay. FTAA, that's what it was called. How can we go to that point? Because what well, the audience is telling you is nice thinking, but what about reality? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know in, in sort of how, how to answer you, but yeah, I, think, yeah, I think we need to change us first, as people are thinking, uh, as we, we think it. Uh, we have to open markets, uh, but... Would you I be concerned know. about the penetration of products from Guadalupe, you know, a small island in the Caribbean? Mm -hmm. Will you be really concerned about that? They have about uh, 60,000 inhabitants. That's about the size of... Um, I don't know, any, any of the colonias of Puebla that should have at least 60,000 people. So would you be concerned about that? Well, no, yes. Then why don't we have a free trade agreement with them and we just walk and say, you can send anything you want inside, you can send all the people you wish. No. Do you mm -hmm. really think that the 60,000 inhabitants of that place will come to Mexico and say, yes, gonna we're going to be become all Mexicans? We're going to be different? No. Probably 3,000, yeah. Uh, the other 57 will remain there. Yeah. Because it's a nice place, by the way. So <laughs> what, what, what do you think then? Politically speaking, one of the questions that we have to ask is, can we really open ourselves to the others without asking anything in return? OK? That's called multilateral trading. And one of the problems that we're facing is we cannot put the multilateral trading in shape. And that's why we got into all this complicated life. So the answer to your question would be yes, let's go back to multilateral trading and then you open your economy in a very single manner because what you are saying is small economies, there is nothing there. The big negotiation is between Mexico and Brazil, 
Mexico and the United States, the United States and Brazil. And the little countries should be getting all the benefits that we provide each other. And as we do that, we will reach some kind of an agreement. But you're absolutely right. Politically speaking, we are not ready for that. Well, I want to thank our two debaters. Thank you very much for being here today. And we will come back to this kind of debates because we have to think seriously as we move more and more. How can we do some of the things that we are talking about? Okay? Thank you very much, Justin. Thank you very much, Justin. Okay.